In this video, I'd like to talk about how we might start thinking about the stuff around us that we see around us, the, or matter as we call it, and um, some of the ideas that might help us to explain some of the phenomenon that we see in our everyday life. Now, you might have sat around on a rainy day and asked yourself, what would happen if I were to take a piece of cardboard or a piece of brick and start cutting it down into smaller and smaller pieces, what would I end up with? Well, many people have probably asked themselves this question, um, including you and I, um, but probably the most famous person to be associated with um, this so-called theory of uh, small things is Democritus. So Democritus was a Greek philosopher, and back in 400 BC, he started asking himself what would happen if I were to cut up a piece of matter, what would be the smallest element that I would get? So he came out with something I like to call the atomic theory. And he asserted that if I were to do that, if I were to cut a piece of matter up into the smallest pieces available, I wouldn't get nothingness, but rather I would get these little balls called atoms. And atoms, um, appropriately, is the Greek word meaning indivisible. So these are the smallest units of matter that we can get, according to Democritus. Now, of course, we have more sophisticated theories of what the atom is today. But what's amazing is that just based on this atomic theory of Democritus that was discovered more than 2,000 years ago, we can actually explain a whole host of phenomena, as we'll see in a little while. In addition to being indivisible, Democritus philosophized that particles, these atoms, as he called them, were indestructible. They have always been here, always will be, and cannot be destroyed. They are in constant motion all the time, no matter how cold they are. And finally, they are infinite in kind, size, and shape, and number as well. So infinite in number, kind, size, and shape. So what I'd like to do now is to see if we can use this notion of matter as being made up of um, little tiny balls that are in constant motion to explain things like why you might smell the cooking uh, in the living room uh, when someone's cooking in the kitchen or why you might smell a perfume from someone from across the room. So let's start by looking at a container. that consists of these atoms in one corner. So I'm going to draw six or seven of them. And these atoms, as Democritus said, are in constant random motion. So they bounce into each other, bounce into the walls of the container, and then bounce off again. So let's show this one here, bouncing into them. So I've, I've eight of them. And this area where there are lots of atoms in a given volume, we say that that's an area of high concentration. So, so the notion of concentration is just the number of particles in a given volume. And over here where we have no particles, we say that this area has a low concentration of the particles. So as the particles move around, since they are constricted by the walls of the container on this side, there's a higher probability for them to kind of drift over in that direction, where it's less crowded. Since it's more crowded here, they're more likely to bounce into each other, and you get, over time, you see that they start spreading out and fill 
the area that's less concentrated. So after a while, what we see is the particles would have uniformly fill the container while still moving around randomly. So of course there's a probability that they might start clumping together in corners of the uh, container or maybe even in the center, but given the random nature of their motion, I would bet that they would kind of stay spread out uh, more often than they would clump together. So there's a name given for this tendency of particles to want to spread out from an area where they are close together, namely an area of high concentration, to an area where there is less of them, namely an area of low concentration, and we call this diffusion. So here's a definition of diffusion from Wikipedia. It says that Diffusion is the spread of particles through random motion from regions of higher concentration to regions of lower concentration. So the next thing that we might want to do is we might want to think up some experiments that we can perform in the lab to show evidence of this spreading of particles through random motion. So one such example might go like this. I'll set up uh, two cylinders. One cylinder here. And I'm going to fill the cylinder with bromine gas. So, bromine gas in the cylinder. And I'll put a piece of cardboard on top of it and then put an empty glass cylinder on top of this cylinder that I've filled with bromine gas. And if I remove the cardboard, what I'll see is that almost instantaneously, or it'll take a few seconds, not instantaneously, I'll see that both glass cylinders will then be filled with this purple gas or bromine, albeit it will be less purple than, than when they were in one container. So they'll be more spread out. So let's take a look at what happened here. Well, if we look at it close up, this say let's look at this section here we have bromine particles mixed in with particles of air so we now have a mixture of bromine and air and they are all moving randomly moving randomly around. And occasionally they bounce off of each other. And they might bounce off of each other. Since the bromine atoms are all clumped together here, um, over time we would expect that the probability of them moving away from each other is higher than them just clumping around. And since the, their walls on both sides and at the bottom of them, they, they would tend to want to move upwards towards the empty container. Well, it's, it's not empty, it contains air. So let me just draw some air up here. So it would appear that since it's so crowded, down here, they would want to move in and fill some of the empty space here 
available to them. And so as time goes on, you see that they start moving from an area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration, meaning an area where there are more bromine molecules per unit volume to an area where there are less bromine, or in this case, no bromine molecules per unit area. Let's take a look at another example. And this time, we'll look at a solid and a liquid. So I'm going to fill my beaker or container with water. And I will put very carefully at the bottom of the beaker a solid block of something we call potassium permanganate. This is something that, oops, this is something that you'll find quite um, easily in the lab. It's a purple substance. So it's made up of these purple at atoms. Let me just redraw this as a block of made up of many purple atoms. And I have my water molecules moving around randomly. Of course these purple atoms are also moving but not as fast as the water molecules around it. And occasionally one of the molecules, water molecules will hit the potassium permanganate molecules and transfer some of its energy to potassium permanganate. So this guy starts moving faster and then another water molecule hits it and starts moving even faster and eventually you gain enough energy to break away from the solid so it starts breaking away and moves into the solution and after a while what we see is that we have let's leave the solid block here and then we'll have quite a high concentration of potassium permanganate molecules and floating around, moving randomly around this um, block of potassium permanganate. And just as we saw with the bromine gas, these guys tend to want to spread out to an area where there are less of them, so they'll start moving into the empty spaces in between the water molecules. So they'll start drifting into the empty spaces meaning the area of lower concentration. And eventually, after a couple of days in this case, because um, it takes quite a long time for the solid to spread in the liquid, we should see that our solid potassium permanganate has completely spread out into this beaker of water and we'll see a purple purplish solution in the beaker. Let's look at another, yet another example. So in this example we can start thinking a little deeper about um, the nature of this spreading out of particles. For example, we might say to ourselves, how does the rate or the speed at which this particle spread out depend on the mass of the particle, for example. So, you know, one would expect that the heavier or the more massive the particles, the slower they move. So, in order to investigate that, we can actually set up an experiment in the lab to do that. So, I'll have a test tube that is open at two ends, and I'll take some cotton wool and soak it in ammonia. So, I'll put the cotton wool soaked in ammonia here 
and I'll have another cotton wool that's soaked in hydrochloric acid over here and I'll cork the two ends of my test tube so what's gonna start happening is that these um, liquid ammonia is gonna start evaporating leaving the cotton wool and start diffusing over to an area of lower concentration meaning they'll start moving in this direction and the hyaluronic acid will start drifting to the left on the whole because there's a high concentration of hydrochloric acid here and a lower concentration here. So they will meet somewhere in the middle. When they do meet, they form something called ammonium chloride. So the ammonia, when it meets the hydrochloric acid, will form ammonium chloride which happens to be a white cloud so ammonia and hydrochloric acid is initially colorless but they'll start forming a white cloud here this is in purple somewhere here now if you were to do this experiment you find that this white cloud of ammonium chloride forms closer to the hydrochloric acid end of the test tube than the ammonia end of the test tube. One conclusion that we can draw from this is that the hydrochloric acid molecules moved more slowly because they moved more slowly than the ammonia molecules than in the same amount of time, um, <clears throat> it covered less distance than the ammonia molecules did. That would be exactly what we would see if we were to perform this experiment. Now the reason for this is that hydrochloric acid molecules are heavier than the ammonia molecules. So um, in arbitrary units, the, the ammonia molecules has a mass, happens to have a mass of 17 while the hydrochloric acid happens to have the mass of 36.5 or, or, or roundabout. So we can see that they are almost twice as heavy. So they would have covered you know, half the distance that the ammonia molecules had covered, roughly speaking. Apart from mass, there are a whole host of other factors that affects how quickly um, particles tend to spread out. For example, perfume tends to spread out more quickly in a warm room than in a colder one. Um, the reason for this is because if the temperature is higher, the particles are moving more quickly and hence they spread out more quickly so you smell the perfume uh, sooner rather than later. So in this video we looked at the atomic theory of matter. Um, we looked at how matter um, could be made up of little balls moving randomly in all directions and we looked at diffusion as an evidence for the um, atomic theory of uh, matter. So in the next several videos we'll look at more evidence for this atomic uh, nature of matter.